hear me? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, uh, for last few months, uh, we've been working with uh, this serverless uh, architectures, and uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, what we did and what are the problems we encountered and stuff like that. So, you can uh, maybe jump in uh, without uh, uh, falling into uh, the pitfalls we trapped in. So uh, what I will do is, first I will uh, talk to you about the evolution of the computing from the uh, physical servers up to serverless computing. And then uh, uh, talk to you about the serverless architecture and what are the components are there in it and what are the things you could do, stuff like that. And finally, I'll be talking about how we did uh, uh, with serverless, like uh, migrating from Rails 1.8 to the serverless. So. Uh, Early in the days, uh, we had uh, physical data servers, so life was pretty hard back then. So if you want to, so imagine you are in a country and you are running a server, suddenly uh, you get like a hike in a uh, lot of requests coming in another country, so you have to uh, pack up some servers uh, there to serve, uh, serve them better. And the server management was really hard. If, you, if one of the boxes goes down, it will really hard for you to uh, maintain. And then uh, later in the timeline, virtualization came in. Uh, things got pretty interested. Uh, the server utilization was uh, uh, getting up to a level uh, which was awesome. And later, the cloud happened. And from physical servers, people moved their all the virtual machines into cloud. And different cloud vendors came in. And like uh, things got even uh, interesting. You don't have to worry about management of the servers. You don't have to like uh, worry about the fallbacks. If your servers goes down, uh, cloud vendor will uh, pop up uh, another uh, set of a uh, bunch of uh, virtual uh, machines. And then finally, the most interesting thing, Docker happened. Uh, the utilization even uh, improved with uh, containerization. You can like uh, use uh, one set of uh, server and have multiple instance. And uh, the actually, the server utilization is Pretty much uh, awesome there, and but still, uh, server management you have to do uh, either you or one of your team members have to do, and uh, provision management of this VM instance is pretty hard uh, if you are not coming from this background, and uh, you will have to constantly uh, work on uh, updating these servers, like uh, security patches, stuff like that, and uh, if your servers goes down, you will have to work even more. Uh, uh, to get these things up and running. So uh, this is Warren Vogel says, no server is easier to manage than no server. So uh, so if you don't have to manage servers, uh, you don't have to worry about anything. So that's where serverless computing comes in. Uh, serverless doesn't mean that there are no servers. It's just uh, you work, but you don't care about uh, the servers. Uh, so uh, there are like. Uh, it's uh, where servers are there. You don't care about servers. You just write the business logic, and uh, someone else is taking care of these servers. The scaling, uh, so like uh, provisioning, utilization, operational uh, management, like uh, server updates, security updates, all these things, uh, especially the scaling. Uh, so you don't have to care about how much scale. Uh, you don't have to anticipate the scale. Uh, so if you get like. Uh, one billion requests, uh, these uh, vendors will support that. If you have uh, one or two uh, requests, still it will support that. And uh, so, uh, talking about the servers, uh, it's where uh, it's not as like a SaaS platform. Uh, when uh, talking about the SaaS, you have like a set of uh, uh, applications you are provided with, but in uh, serverless computing. You have these services, but also you can do the computational part. You can manage, uh, uh, say you get a request, you know what are the things you have to do. So you just write uh, the business logic and fit in these uh, uh, pro with providers, so they will uh, do the uh, other work. So uh, currently, this is uh, like a trending uh, architecture. Uh, it's like uh, from like uh, two, three years back then, it's popped up, and even GitHub. Uh, uh, dedicated another uh, like uh, explorer page for serverless architecture, but uh, this may be a fad, but uh, we are not sure. Uh, we'll have to see like uh, what will happen in another two three years. But it's completely growing. Uh, so talking about like the big players, uh, Airbnb, Expedia, Coq, and Atlassian uh, players like this, 
work this serverless architecture. So if I talk about a couple of uh, statistics, uh, Thomson Routers uh, uh, process about uh, 4,000 requests per second. FINRA uh, process half a trillion validation per day uh, using serverless. And Vivo handles about 80% uh, traffic uh, with serverless. Expedia uh, triggers 1.2 billion Lambda requests. And another interesting uh, use, uh, case study is the Australian uh, census website. Uh, basically, uh, what they did was they spent about 10 million Australian dollars uh, to get a, a census site uh, with like load balancing and uh, the scaling, everything tested. But the, uh, when they deployed it, first day, uh, first day onwards, uh, the site got crashed because the traffic, uh, the uh, scale was uh, not enough. Uh, but a couple of guys uh, in a hackathon uh, used serverless architectures and uh, tools and build an application like under $500, which catered to these scales. So at the moment, there are like a number of vendors providing uh, uh, capabilities uh, for serverless. Uh, the main player is the AWS Lambda. And then we have Google Cloud Functions, uh, Azure Functions, and uh, Really uh, awesome open source project is the OpenWhisk. Uh, they are giving you the uh, all serverless uh, background uh, developed with uh, open source. If you want a private fast, uh, you can use OpenWhisk. So just to get an understanding about the cost, uh, I'll do a little comparison here. So imagine you have a, a system where you get like 1,600 requests per day at uh, each request take like 200 millisecond to process. If you uh, use a uh, EC2 boxes, uh, two EC2 boxes, it will cost you around three dollars per day. But uh, using a lambda, you can uh, reduce cost up to uh, 0.05 dollars. Uh, likewise, so uh, in this case, uh, we've been using AWS technology. So uh, later of this presentation, a lot of my uh, insights will be uh, towards AWS. But uh, all these things you can do with OpenWhisk, uh, Microsoft Cloud, or even uh, Google Cloud. So if you talk about the AWS toolbox, uh, these are the set of services you can basically uh, do a lot of things around uh, serverless computing. Main pillar is AWS Lambda, uh, where you get uh, to do the computational part. And then there are S3. Uh, you get the storage. And uh, you can even host a static website there. And you have, for the database, you can get RESO, DynamoDB. Uh, if you want to like handle uh, HTTP request and other stuff, and also, you want to have another set of APIs and uh, have a mediator in between. You can use the API gateway. And if you want some sort of uh, uh, message queuing services, you can use the SQS and for the notification uh, SNS. If you want to, uh, like uh, the request uh, coming up in the uh, when you whenever you get a request, uh, you want to like uh, throw it into an anal uh, analyze, uh, analyzing. You can use a Kinesis stream, and uh, all these things. If you want to do sort of uh, orchestration, you can use. Uh, step functions and uh, for the monitoring you can use extra like uh, there are a number of services you can use uh, it's up to you to decide uh, what are the services you want to use on so uh, let me talk to you about uh, how to get a serverless function up and running uh, yes, uh, so basic step is you have to go to uh, serverless lambda page and this is where you get code you have to name your function and you have to like uh, give it a description and runtime uh, there are a uh, number of runtimes are introduced in AWS Lambda, uh, Node.js, Python, Go, uh, even C Sharp is supported, and a lot of languages are coming in. Uh, like this, uh, Microsoft also support a lot of uh, technologies. Google Cloud Functions support a lot of things. Uh, AWS, uh, sorry, uh, Apache OpenWhisk support a lot of uh, languages. Uh, so you don't have to care about the language you use. All you have to care about uh, what you want to do and what are the uh, uh, problems you have to solve. So basically, uh, you have to code uh, the logic if some sort of request or event happens. What do you want to do? So basically, you write uh, your logic here. That's it. And you don't have to care about anything other than that. The scaling, everything will be handled later. Forget about it. Uh, so uh, you can uh, set off, uh, assign set of uh, triggers for this lambda. Uh, you can say. If you get a HTTP request, uh, trigger this lambda. If you want like a webhook or something else, uh, trigger this lambda. Likewise, you can uh, set assign a number of uh, different uh, sources 
to uh, this lambda for to tri triggered. If we talk about the HTTP uh, event, uh, so uh, I have a API gateway here. Uh, say uh, for uh, I have a API where uh, uh, HTTP get request is anticipated. Uh, when the request happens, uh, it goes through this cycle. Uh, first of all, you can hook up uh, uh, authentication service uh, as the initial uh, check. Uh, if you don't want, you can have it there. And uh, if you want, like uh, like alter or modify the request headers or stuff like that, you can use the second box. And then it will call the Lambda function. And then you can uh, modify your response and then again pass it to the user as well. So this is the basic skeleton of uh, Lambda functions and uh, API gateway. So uh, whenever HTTP request comes in, uh, you can do whatever you things you want, and you uh, pass in the response. Uh, so you, all you have to care about is uh, only that part. Uh, the uh, the servers, you don't know what are the operating system uh, runs underneath. Uh, you don't know what are the security updates. But the service provider is actually taking care of these things. So as you see, you will have to work on number of services to get these things done. So you'll have to work with Lambda, or API Gateway, or any other service. But a uh, set of guys uh, who uh, work with open source technologies came up with like uh, frameworks to make this easier. So currently, there are two major frameworks, and there are a number of uh, 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 another frameworks. But these two are uh, like standing in. Uh, Apex is one. The serverless framework is another one. Uh, Apex is totally focused on the Amazon Web Stack. Uh, but the serverless guys are trying to uh, uh, generalize it and have a number of uh, providers uh, on board. Currently, they support AWS stack, uh, Microsoft stack, and the OpenWhisk stack. Uh, currently, people are working on uh, getting Google functions up and running. And so if we talk about the serverless framework, uh, because I have uh, tried with uh, serverless framework, and uh, it is really easy to uh, get your server service up and running. So all you have to do is install serverless and create a template. Uh, so you can uh, define your, uh, say, using Node.js template, uh, you create a function. And you just uh, fill up the building blocks uh, where you type your function and you tell what are the things you want to do. And then you just uh, type uh, serverless deploy, and it will create all the API gateways, all the lambdas, and stuff like that. And uh, basically, uh, you can uh, either curl or you can do uh, check all the stuff like that. and this is the basic steps. There are much more things are in it. So you can go and read about it and stuff like that. Uh, another cool thing about serverless is there are a lot of, uh, they have their core uh, as a very simple core, uh, but there are uh, extensible frameworks. So there are a number of plugins available. So if you want to do, uh, so if you want to plug in the DynamoDB related things, you can uh, use another plugin. Uh, if you want to do sort of Alexa related things, you can uh, plug in another uh, plugin, stuff like that. And there are a bunch of examples as well. Uh, if you want to see uh, what are the things you can do and how, the, how, how are they doing it, uh, you can refer to their examples page. There are like uh, 30 odd uh, tutorials uh, set up uh, from uh, basics to their boilerplates. So uh, let's talk about a case study where we got uh, our hands dirty with these technologies. So Kaveya is an application which we worked in. It's a, like a checklist management system. Uh, so talk about the uh, architecture. We had a, a web client and the mobile client. Uh, inside a, uh, AWS, uh, we had our backend. So it's connected to CloudFront. And uh, we had uh, two different services. Uh, one is our API, another Snap service, uh, which is connected to two uh, e uh, ECES containers, and uh, which is talking to a MySQL uh, RDS instance. So uh, the technologies we were using is uh, uh, Rails 1.8, uh, Ruby 1.8, and uh, MySQL. And uh, for the front end, we were using Angular, uh, stuff like that. Uh, but uh, there were a lot of dependencies which we couldn't get to update uh, with the Ruby uh, 2.0. So it was a lot of work to get it uh, updated. So we thought of, uh, let's have the system as it is. So uh, we'll try to extract as much as possible uh, functions out of the system, and we'll re-implement it using serverless so we can uh, cater th them with uh, new technology. So uh, 
we had uh, active users uh, using uh, the application, so we couldn't uh, take down our applications. So uh, what we thought of is going to a microservice approach. So uh, we decompose our monolith application into different different services, but talk again, uh, which we were uh, sharing the same database, but from the service approach, uh, we thought of uh, getting into different services. And uh, database, we extracted some of data into uh, schemalas and uh, different different uh, uh, databases. And uh, uh, to make the life easier, we use serverless framework. So after uh, experimenting a lot of things, uh, we uh, decompose our uh, existing application and we uh, again implemented it with uh, serverless framework as well. So we had two different uh, set of services up and running, uh, one with ser uh, serverless and one with uh, the ECS clusters. So if a user comes in and uh, uh, if he uh, go into the API, it, he will be redirected to the uh, serverless approach and the other existing uh, APIs will be redirected to the EC2 cluster. So uh, other than that, uh, the serverless approach uh, was using uh, MongoDB as well and it was uh, for the data which was already in our database, uh, he was talking to uh, uh, the RDS using the VPC. So uh, there are a like, lot of things coming up. Uh, so a uh, lot of cool stuff like uh, step functions and edge functions. So uh, talking about the step functions, you can like, uh, if you have like a set of uh, paths, uh, like a state machine, uh, you can use these step functions to uh, re uh, recreate this uh, stuff. And uh, there's a really cool feature coming up called edge functions where uh, lamb uh, uh, in the AWS ecosystem, there are a lot of uh, availability zones and uh, edge locations. So you can run these functions in their edges rather than uh, going into a, a, a server itself. So whenever a request comes in, he, he, the request will be served from the edge itself rather than going into their main servers. So uh, that's really cool. And I talk about all the good things about serverless. Uh, it's not always good. Uh, you'll have to uh, think about uh, the down, uh, uh, like uh, bad parts as well. So uh, with serverless, uh, it, even though it's serverless underneath, it uses a containerized mechanism. So uh, it, there's a thing called hot start versus call start, uh, where whenever, whenever your service gets up and running, it comes to a hot state. But uh, if it is uh, booting, uh, like a, uh, if you have uh, s like a less requests coming in, it will automatically go into the call start. So if it is in call start, uh, to get it up and running, it may take a while. So you'll have to think about that. And uh, there are certain currently hacks available to keep your uh, lambdas up uh, in a hot state. But uh, we'll see how things will go. And in the future, there may be uh, services to get, uh, keep your uh, fun uh, functions uh, hot in the uh, always. And it's not advisable to use. <coughs> It's not advisable to use long-running process with serverless. Uh, if you want to have like long-running process, uh, it's better to use a container. And still, you want uh, if you want to have uh, the control of your server, it's better to use uh, containers rather than use going to uh, serverless. And a uh, couple of like uh, downfalls is that uh, there are a lot of core duplications and logic duplications happen in uh, these uh, serverless areas, and. If your uh, service is depending on a lot of libraries, uh, it's not good to use serverless because whenever a request comes in, uh, all these uh, like uh, libraries has to be loaded with your container. And uh, to get it up and running, it might take a while. So with the uh, talking about runtime, it might be uh, not good as much as uh, using a container itself. So. And another uh, key thing is you are locked into a vendor at the moment. But uh, the serverless framework guys is uh, trying to make it abstract so you can like switch between providers. But the switching part has not been implemented yet. So people are talking about how to, uh, if you have a set of ser uh, services written uh, catering towards AWS, uh, how you can get it uh, up and running with uh, open risk stuff like that. Uh, that's, that hasn't been implemented yet. But Serverless guys are talking about how we can implement it uh, like that. So uh, with that, uh, I think I can conclude uh, my session. Uh, so if you want to talk about it more, uh, any of these medias, you can uh, use RHRVMESH to contact me. Uh, uh, 
uh, you can send me an email to rumesh h at 99x.lk. So thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, the Apache OpenWhisk. Yeah. It's been there quite uh, some time, but I haven't like uh, played with it uh, for uh, long. Uh, I know it has like uh, capabilities to serve uh, HTTP request, and uh, it's written on uh, Kubernetes. And uh, people are uh, so this open source version is using used by uh, IBM for their uh, service. Uh, so I'm not too sure about it, uh, whether it's like uh, catering like in the same level as AWS Lambda. Uh, but it's in a good level to serve your uh, basic needs. But I'm not too sure about uh, how good it is. Any other questions for Ramesh? Okay, thank right. you.